happy Saturday, everyone. Today's classic episode looks at the Harlem Hellfighters. This was a segregated army unit in World War I, and it also specifically focuses on Henry Johnson, who was a member of that unit who was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor on June 2nd of 2015. One of the things that this episode talks about is the connection between returning World War II veterans and the civil rights movement in the United States, and why there wasn't a similar movement when Black veterans returned from World War I. A piece of that discussion is Red Summer, which we talked about in more detail in our episode from June 3rd, 2019. This episode originally came out on November 2nd, 2015. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Pretty recently, we talked about Macario Garcia. And we talked in that episode about how World War II often comes up as one of the factors of many that led to the United States Civil Rights Movement. So told very simply, soldiers who had put their lives on the line to serve their country and to fight against oppression abroad came back home to fight against oppression where they actually lived. And this story is usually told as it related to African-American soldiers and World War II. And in this particular case of the episode, we already did. Macario Garcia was a Mexican national. So after he returned from World War II, his experience being denied service at a Texas restaurant contributed to a social movement for equal rights for Mexican-Americans and other Hispanics and Latinos who were living in that part of the United States. So when we did that episode on Macario Garcia, we hinted that World War II was not the only time this happened, that the the subject of that was going to be in an upcoming episode, and that is today's episode. We are going to tell this story about World War I's effect on civil rights in the United States by talking about the Harlem Hellfighters. This was a segregated regiment that served in combat in World War I. So we're going to start by talking about the regiment itself. Then we are going to talk about one of its most decorated members as an example of the just really exceptional valor and courage that the Hellfighters exhibited while they were serving in World War I. And lastly, we're going to talk about why World War I does not come up very often when we are talking about things that inspired civil rights activity in the United States. It's much more overshadowed by World War II. And whenever we talk about segregation on the podcast, we make it a point to note that the practice was not something that was confined to the South. That sort of rumor sort of persists. Yeah. Somebody emailed us about it the other day, even though I feel like we just, we keep saying it. We're going to say it again today, very directly. Not just the South. Uh, although formalized, legally enforced segregation persisted in the South longer than it did, than it did in many other parts of the United States. And in a lot of ways, it was most obvious there which is also here where we are, uh, segregation really existed all over the nation. For example, President Woodrow Wilson, who had promised in his campaign to treat African-Americans fairly if he was elected, instead started taking steps to allow segregation of federal government positions almost immediately after his inauguration in 1913. Many, many black federal workers all over the country were segregated or flat out dismissed as a result. The United States Armed Forces were segregated as well. In the years leading up to World War I, the Marines did not accept black soldiers at all. The Navy did accept a few, although most of them were restricted to support and manual labor roles. So most black soldiers who served in the military wound up serving in the Army, which was segregated. There were also almost no black army officers, and the black army officers who did exist were not ever placed in command of white soldiers. They were only placed in command of black soldiers. In addition to being restricted to segregated units, black soldiers serving in World War I faced violence while still in the United States. Before being sent overseas, these men were sent into the South, sometimes the Deep South, to be trained. And large numbers of armed black men were often explicitly not wanted in the southern states, and the sudden influx of so many black soldiers led to some very real hostilities and, on more than one occasion, riots and murders. The Army has also been fairly candid in acknowledging that it discriminated specifically against black soldiers during this time apart from just placing them in segregated units, which, as we have talked in many other podcasts before, segregation based on race is inherently discriminatory. 
So command at this point did not think that black men were suited for combat. They were viewed as untrustworthy and lazy and complacent. So overwhelmingly, black soldiers were assigned to work as manual laborers. So most of the 200,000 black soldiers who went overseas in World War I wound up working as stevedores. They dug ditches. They dug latrines. And to be clear, this was absolutely essential work. It needed to be done. But it was also often backbreaking and degrading and overwhelmingly being assigned to only the black soldiers. Black soldiers were also the ones who were frequently tasked with burying the dead. Only about 42,000 black soldiers saw combat in World War I. These men served in the 92nd and 93rd Combat Divisions. The 92nd mostly comprised men who had been drafted along with their officers and was part of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in 1918. This offensive did not go as well as hoped, and the 92nd wound up being a scapegoat for everything that had gone wrong. Their time in combat was brief. The 93rd, on the other hand, was made up primarily of National Guard units, including the 15th New York Colored Regiment. About 70% of the men in this regiment were from Harlem in New York, and these were the men who would go on to be nicknamed the Harlem Hellfighters. The 93rd Combat Division, under the command of Colonel William Hayward, wound up essentially being loaned to France to fill a labor shortage in their own army. And this was in spite of the fact that when the United States entered the war, the president had assured the population that U.S. soldiers would not be on loan to other armies. They would be fighting as American units under American command. So when it went overseas, the 15th New York Colored Regiment was renamed the the 369th Infantry. And the 369th served 191 days in combat. This was longer than any other American unit in World War I. Contrary to the American military's assumption that black soldiers were not fit for combat and for their expectations for how black soldiers would perform, uh, the 369th Infantry became one of the most decorated units to serve in the war. Much like German forces named Russia's all-female night bombers the Night Witches in World War II, they nicknamed the 369th the Blüterstick Schwarze Manner, or the Bloodthirsty Black Men, in World War I. And this nickname was eventually translated into the Hellfighters. In addition to their consistent valor and high performance in combat, the 369th Infantry's marching band was also a skilled and talented one and was one of the ways that jazz music made its way from the United States to France during the war. The Harlem Hellfighters' time in combat was so prolonged and it touched so many actions on the Western Front that it's actually difficult to get a sense of their remarkable heroism and valor. So to get a glimpse of it, uh, we are going to talk about one of their most incredible members who really exemplifies what we're talking about. But first, we are going to have a word from one of our great sponsors. So we are going to tell the story uh, of how the 369th Infantry was pretty incredible in their service by talking about specifically the story of Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson was born William Henry Johnson in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and he moved to New York when he was a teenager. Once he got there, he worked at a variety of jobs, most of them involving manual labor, until he eventually became a red cap porter at the Albany, New York train station. Later, he joined the National Guard unit that would become part of the Harlem Hellfighters. In May of 1918, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts, both of them then privates, were acting as sentries at a lookout post in the Argonne Forest on the Western Front. Johnson heard the sound of someone snipping through barbed wire. Concluding that this was a German advance, he sent Roberts to go for help, called for help himself, and then lobbed grenades at the source of the sound. It was indeed a German advance, and the Germans returned fire with both grenades and bullets. Roberts turned back to try to help Johnson, and both men were hit. Roberts was actually hurt so badly that he was not able to continue fighting. So he passed grenades to Johnson, and Johnson threw them at the approaching Germans until he ran out. And then Johnson got his rifle and he fired upon the advancing German soldiers until his weapon jammed after he accidentally tried to use an American clip with a French rifle. At this point, the German soldiers closed into hand-to-hand range. And so Johnson tried to fight them off, basically by swinging his rifle like a club until the butt of it literally splintered. 
And Johnson, we should point out, was not a large man. He was only about five foot four. He weighed about 130 pounds. And once his rifle was destroyed, he was struck in the head and knocked down. But then he saw that the German soldiers were trying to take the injured Private Roberts prisoner. So Johnson managed to get to his feet. He pulled out the only weapon he had left, which was his bolo knife, and he fought back with that while trying to drag Roberts to safety. Fortunately, at this point, the sounds of gunfire and grenades and their calls for help had brought other soldiers to their aid. So Johnson continued trying to drag Roberts away from the fighting until he lost consciousness. Fortunately, that was when reinforcements arrived and the German soldiers who were still upright fled. In the morning, it was revealed that then Private Johnson had single-handedly killed four enemy soldiers and wounded somewhere between 10 and 20 more, all while he was injured himself with 21 wounds sustained in this combat and refusing to allow his compatriot to be taken captive. So both men were awarded the Croix de Guerre, which is the French military decoration for valor and heroism. This made Johnson and Roberts the first American privates of any race to earn this recognition. And Johnson and Roberts were not the only members of the Harlem Hellfighters to ultimately be awarded the Croix de Guerre for their valor. All in all, 171 individual members of the Harlem Hellfighters received the Croix de Guerre. And the unit as a whole was awarded one as well for capturing Seychelles while advancing ahead of French and other American lines. The Harlem Hellfighters were the first to reach the Rhine after the armistice, and they were commended again and again for their valor. So basically, they performed above and beyond the call for any combat unit, and especially in a way that flew in the face of what the American command was expecting of them. Yeah, I don't think you could get a much more um, kind of poignant portrait of heroism. Right. So roughly 800 Harlem Hellfighters lost their lives in Europe. About 3,000 others returned home from the war in February of 1919. They had a welcome home parade in which they marched up Fifth Avenue in New York and into their home neighborhood of Harlem. And this parade was, in part, to make up for the fact that on their departure from New York in December of 1917, they had not been permitted to take part in the New York National Guard's farewell parade through New York City. The New York National Guard was known as the Rainbow Division because it included members from 27 states. And the reason for the 15th New York Regiment's exclusion was black is not a color of the rainbow. On their return, however, the Harlem Hellfighters received a legitimate hero's welcome. Accounts vary wildly about how many people were there for the parade. You will find news sources that cite anywhere from 200,000 people to more than 2 million Johnson was riding in a car for injured veterans, and in spite of the fact that he had a shattered foot that was held together with a metal plate, he stood up to wave at them, and people called him Black Death. The response from both white and black onlookers at the parade was so ebulliently positive that to many, it was a symbol of hope for improved race relations to come. And this was bolstered by the fact that President Theodore Roosevelt called Johnson one of the five bravest Americans to serve in the war. That's high praise. And the army used his image on recruitment posters and to sell victory war stamps. I couldn't find a picture of this actual advertisement, but reportedly what it says on it is Johnson licked a dozen Germans. How many stamps have you licked? (laughs) I licked for I could. Yeah, (laughs) that's some copywriting. Uh Uh-huh. So all of this, Johnson's fame as a war hero, the overwhelming tide of support for the returning black veterans, this overall theme that the war had been fought in a quote to make the world safe for democracy gave a lot of people hope that this signaled a major change in the social and legal status of African-Americans in the United States. Sadly, this was not to be true, and we are going to talk about why and how after another brief word from a sponsor. So when he was committing American troops to World War I, Woodrow Wilson very famously said that quote, the world must be made safe for democracy. We alluded to that just before the break. But when African-American soldiers returned home to find that they were still the targets of segregation, discrimination and oppression, it really seemed like there was an unspoken for white people at the end of that sentence, hoping to tie the fight for civil rights to the ideals that had underpinned the United States very involvement in the war. And the fact that so many black soldiers had returned as highly decorated heroes Black civil rights 
uh, leaders called for action. The idea of making the world safe for democracy came up again and again in articles, speeches, pamphlets, and other materials about equal rights for black citizens. In May of 1919, for example, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, quote, returning soldiers, we return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America or know the reason why. But this is not the war that winds up being referenced in terms of how it affected civil rights. That distinction always, as we've said, goes to World War II. The biggest reason for this is that it's much easier to frame World War II as a more positive story. Following World War II, returning black veterans added their voices to a growing grassroots movement all over the nation, which coalesced into what we know as the civil rights movement today. And although there was definitely a violent backlash and lots of resistance that was a hallmark to uh, part of this movement, it did eventually lead to civil rights legislation that was meant to help put black Americans on more equal footing. That's an oversimplified way to look at World War II, but no amount of oversimplification can put the years following World War I into such a positive light. World War I ended on November 11th of 1918. The following summer, violence broke out all over the United States, driven by a number of social and economic factors. One was a backlash against advocacy for equal treatment of African Americans, especially as others began to view this movement as militant. But also in play was the return of soldiers who had fought in the war, colliding with what's known as the Great Migration. So in the Great Migration, which peaked between 1914 and 1920, huge numbers of African-Americans living in the South moved north. Many of them were fleeing po- uh, poverty and social and political oppression. People who had been living as sharecroppers in the South moved north to get industrial jobs, many of which were tied to the war effort in the hope of getting better incomes and more freedom. So this dramatically shifted the racial landscape in many northern cities. This also meant that many white veterans in the North returned home to find that their industrial jobs had been filled by black workers who had moved up from the South. Returning soldiers of all races and ethnicities wound up in competition for a shrinking supply of jobs. As a result of these and many other factors, the summer of 1919 was so violent and so deadly that it came to be known as Red Summer. Eighty-three people are known to have been lynched in 1919, up from 64 in 1918. Ku Klux Klan activity also spread, especially in the South. And then there were what is often described as race riots, which broke out in Washington, D.C., Chicago, Omaha, Knoxville, and many other cities. However, as we discussed in our episode on the Tulsa race riot and Black Wall Street, the term race riot is often a misnomer because it suggests racial violence in which the races involved are equal aggressors. It was a misnomer during the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, and it was a misnomer during Red Summer. Overwhelmingly, the instigators in Red Summer were white citizens, and overwhelmingly, black people, along with their homes, businesses, and entire neighborhoods, were the victims. One of the most dramatic moments in Red Summer took place that July when a riot broke out in Chicago after a black teenager drowned. He had been using a customarily whites-only beach, and people did not like that, and they stoned him. So he drowned after being stoned. As a result of this particular riot, almost 40 people were killed, 500 were injured, and about a 1,000 black families were left homeless after a white mob burned their homes down. The last major event in Red Summer actually took place in October. In Elaine, Arkansas, black sharecroppers attempting to organize themselves to advocate for better treatment were massacred by a white mob. Somewhere between 100 and 200 black sharecroppers were killed. In the aftermath, many more black sharecroppers were arrested and jailed. Many were put on trial and some were sentenced to death by all white juries, even though they had actually been the victims and not the instigators. So that's why even though World War I inspired a groundswell of organized advocacy for equal rights for black citizens, it doesn't come to the forefront very often. And it's also not a particularly good place to end this episode. So we are going to turn back to the story of Henry Johnson for a moment. 
So there's widespread belief that Johnson received no disability compensation from the government because of a clerical error in his discharge papers and that he died in obscure poverty. So while the last part of that is actually sadly mostly true, the first part does not hold up under examination of the records. News articles and military records from the time indicate that Johnson was a patient at Walter Reed Hospital, that he received a disability stipend, stipend of about $90 a month, which would not have been a lot of money, but was there. Most of this misinformation stems from the fact that Herman Johnson, who served with the Tuskegee Airmen, seems to have mistakenly, genuinely believed that Henry Johnson was his father. He gave interviews about his father's life that were based on his own knowledge, which was actually incomplete. And Johnson did die at a sadly young age of myocarditis after having had a series of complications with the many injuries he sustained in combat, along with tuberculosis. He was buried in Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors on July 5th of 1929. The site of his grave was actually lost until 2002. In the intervening years, his family had believed that he was actually buried in an anonymous grave in Albany, in part because they had lost touch with him, and in part because the army made a clerical error in the name of who was buried in the grave. Henry Johnson was posthumously awarded a Purple Heart, which is for soldiers who were wounded or killed in action, in 1996. It didn't actually exist yet when he was wounded. In 2003, after the location of his grave was found, he was also awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, and he was posthumously promoted to sergeant. After finding a memo from General John J. Pershing describing Johnson's valorous deeds in a database, Senator Charles Schumer of New York started a petition to have him posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Sergeant Henry Johnson was awarded the Medal of Honor on June 2, 2015. It was accepted on his behalf by Command Sergeant Major Lewis Wilson of the New York National Guard. His official citation ends, quote, Private Johnson's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. And there is also a cool graphic novel about the whole thing. I think it is probably cool. It's by Max Brooks, who has done a lot of other graphic novels, some of them not historically related at all. I did check it out from the library. I have not yet had time to read it before recording this episode, but it looks really good. (sighs) So that is... That's a rough one. It is. Well, it's kind of a meandering story through... I, I think I might have said this in the show before. We have three categories of sad episodes, right? We have the ones that we know are going to be sad. And then we get into it and we realize it's a lot sadder than we thought. And then we have the ones that we know are going to be really sad, but we are doing them because we think it's important or maybe a lot of people have asked us to do it. And then we have the ones that are like today, which is that I pick something because it sounds cool. And then I get into it and I go, oh, this is this is hurting me. So I had picked the Harlem Hellfighters based on probably a uh, like a, a blog post or a Tumblr post or something somewhere that was about this really amazing all black fighting regiment in World War One and how great they were and how much valor and bravery they exhibited and how awesome. And I was like, well, yeah, I want to talk about those guys. And then I was like, oh, dear, <laughs> this sad. Oh, sad things are happening. Yeah. History's full of those surprise little pop ups of sadness. sadness. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 